Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your presence with us this morning as we sing praises to you, as we worship you, as we glorify you, as we praise you. We pray now, Lord, that as our hearts have been warmed and prepared to the songs of praise to you, that you would give us hearts to receive your word and a mind to understand your word and your Holy Spirit speak to us, each and every one of us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit this morning to preach your word. That it come from your spirit and not from my flesh. And so, Father, lead us this morning. And bless us now in this part of your service. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to speak <coughs> about thanksgivers. Or giving thanks to God. Now when we talk about thanksgivers, we're talking about people who thank God for their blessings. There's a lot of people who are thanking God. And we need to thank God, and it's wonderful to see, especially athletes and sports persons, when they when they done well, when they've been interviewed, how they interviewed, how uh, you see them actually thanking God for their gifts and their talents. It's wonderful to see that. Or we think of a mother when you see a mother's child goes goes to school, and the child comes home a bit late. I remember my mother was waiting for me one day to come home from school. I was only in, uh, I think it was standard one or something. And um, I suppose those days it was probably okay for children to walk home from school on their own. But I, she was waiting for me. I, I decided to go play with one of my friends. And about four o'clock I decided to come walking home with my socks hanging down, dragging my bag behind me kicking my feet through the puddles of water and whistling like and my mother saw me coming down the road and she ran to me and she was so grateful for me to be home she thanked God but she gave me a smack on every syllable where the hang have you been but she was so glad to see me a father reminding his child to say thank you when they receive something. Uh, so often you hear children not say thank you. You wonder why their parents don't teach them to say thank you. You see, it's important to say thank you, especially to God, our Creator. You see, to be honest, many of us have thanksgiving faces. We say thank you and we got that thanksgiving face, but do we really have a thanksgiving heart? Because when we are really grateful and we giving thanks to God for His blessings, the manifestation of that thanksgiving should be lived out in our lives and we should show how grateful we are. And I think, to be honest, I don't think we always do that. We grumble more than being grateful. I know I do. I mean, there's so much to grumble about at the moment. We grumble about a lot of stuff and yet... There's so much to be grateful for. I wonder if you'll be surprised to find that we are more grumblers than worshippers. A challenge to all of us. Now today I want us to look at a familiar story, story in Luke's Gospel chapter 17, verse 11 to 19, where we see how, and we'll see in the story how Jesus feels about those folk who are truly thankful for God's blessings. Did you know Jesus is taking note? He's taking note of how full or how empty our heart is of gratitude. Do you think God doesn't notice? Do you think Jesus doesn't notice? What does it mean for believers of Jesus Christ to be true thanksgivers? What does that mean? Well, let me give you a few pointers. Firstly, True thanksgivers remember their utmost desperation for Christ. We remember our utmost desperation for Christ. The story begins with Jesus traveling. Soon he will have reached Jerusalem where he will die on the cross. 
In our story, we see that he's near Samaria. Now we know that the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were a mixed breed. If you look at John chapter 4 verse 9, they called them mixed breed, but they were actually cousins, but the Jews hated them. Jesus enters an unknown village where from a distance, ten lepers, aware of Jesus' reputation for healing, see Jesus and they try to get Jesus to notice them. Luke 17, 11 to 13. It says these words, let me read it to you again. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men where leprosy met him. They stood at the distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. <coughs> See, leprosy was a disease of slow, lingering death. I want to give you a brief description of what leprosy is, and I've taken it from William Barclay's commentary, just to give you an idea in those days what type of disease it was. It might begin with little nodules, which go on to become ulcers. The ulcers develop a foul discharge. Soon the eyebrows fall out, the eyes become staring, the vocal cords become ulcerated, and the voice becomes hoarse, and the breath wheezes. Slowly the suffering becomes a mass of ulcerated growths. It ends in mental decay, coma, and ultimate death, a very scary disease. Leprosy might begin with a loss of all sensation. In some part of the body, the nerves are affected, the muscles wasted away, the tendons contract until the hands are like claws. There follows ulceration of the hands and feet. Then comes a progressive loss of fingers and toes until in the end a whole hand or a whole foot may drop off. So if a rat gnaws off a leper's finger overnight, the, finger, the victim might not even realize it until the morning. The duration of that kind of leprosy is anything from 20 to 30 years. It's a slow process. Of, of death and dying and losing limbs and then of course to be completely banished from society in those days. If a, leper, if a leper entered your house, the house was declared unclean. They were not allowed near people. That is why they stood at the distance in the story. They would not have the simple joys of life. No wedding invitations. No children to hold. Never been smiled at. Never greeted on the street. No singing hymns with believers. No having a meal with a family. They were miserable people without hope. Just think about that for a moment. So you can imagine when they heard that a rabbi, a healer, was around and they all gathered together and they cried out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. A desperation, a cry of desperation from the very pit of their being. They were desperate. Nothing else mattered. None of them thought my leprosy is not that bad. They knew they were nothing. They needed to get to Jesus. There's something about this story that makes me think that anything in life, anything in life that shows us our need for God is a blessing no matter what shape or form it is. I believe that such a desperate heart will always be noticed by Jesus. A desperate heart will always be noticed by Jesus. There's nothing that can stop a soul that desperately wants Jesus from being able to reach out to him and for the Lord not to hear that cry. Jesus stops everything for the one who stops to cry out to him in desperation. He stops everything. I think of my own life, and I've shared this before, but I I have to share because it's my own personal story. I think of my own life on many occasions crying out to the Lord in desperation for both of my sick children, trying to get Him to change their situation and their lives. And the lady especially was a miracle at that time. God gave her His grace for 45 years, to live 45 years, where most children died at a very young age from this disease called Fanconi anemia. You see, God blessed her, and yet 
She suffered much in her life, even at the end. And my other daughter at 16, she passed away at an early age. And so the cry of desperation is not unheard by the Lord. In spite of the prayers not being answered in a way that I wanted the Lord to answer my prayers. You see, Jesus noticed me. He notices us and he's moved with compassion for us. Because he hasn't stopped blessing me in spite of the tragedies of my life. But you see, my sisters and brothers, the greatest miracle was me coming to faith in Jesus at the baptism and preparation of my youngest daughter, Bonita, in 1979, the one who died at 16. If it wasn't for her being born, if it wasn't for that whole process, I wouldn't have given my heart to the Lord. And so I praise Him. I praise Him for His glory. I praise Him for His goodness. And now, 43 years later, after many trials and tribulations, I realize that I'm not as desperate as I used to be. Maybe, maybe it's because I started to take life for granted. We can get used to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Think of all the beauty of God's creation around us that we take for granted because we've gotten used to it. The sea around us. How often do you find people who live at the sea after a while? When they're living at the sea and they've got the beautiful view of the sea, after a while forget that the sea is even there. And when someone comes to visit them and they see the view, they say, wow, you've got this amazing view. And they say, yes, I know, but I haven't noticed it for the last couple of months. So often people do that. You just live. The stars at night. How often do we go out and look at the stars at night and just see the beauty of it, especially when we're out in the country? The sunsets. I mean, Gordon's Bay has got the most beautiful sunsets. Bright red, orange, the most amazing sunsets. And then our loved ones. How often don't we take our loved ones for granted? The ones who love us, the ones we love, they're just there. This is what happened to believers over time. We get used to the wonder. We are no longer amazed at our salvation. We forget our God has saved us and we forget to be thanksgivers. We forget to thank Him for our blessings. Scripture says that God opposes, which literally means goes to war against the proud. When we puffed up, when we can think we can do everything on our own, but God cannot resist desperation and humility when we humble ourselves before Him and we say, Lord, I need you. God cannot resist that. Reach out to Him in desperation, sisters and brothers. He's attracted to weakness and opposed to our delusions of strength. Reach out to Him. The second point I want to make about true thanksgivers True thanksgivers are interested in the giver, not just his gifts. Interested in Jesus the Christ that more than just his gifts. Interestingly, Jesus simply looks at them and tells them to go to the priest when we look at the story of these lepers. Did you notice how he never touched them when they cried out to him? He just said to them, to show yourself to the priest. And we know that Jesus is not afraid to touch lepers. He's done this before. In Luke chapter 5 verse 13, he touched them. And he doesn't even say to them, be healed. He tells them, go to the priest. You see, the priests in those days were the health inspectors. Before you would be admitted back into society, the priest had to examine your body if you were a leper to see if you are whole before you would be allowed back into society. So Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Let them examine you. Now notice that they weren't healed straight away. And this whole process of the priest looking at them, it's about an eight-day process of being examined and then offering sacrifices to God. 
And then finally they would be reunited with their family. Jesus says, go to the priest. Why is this? I wonder if Jesus is testing their faith. Why didn't he heal them just straight away? They suddenly saw. But if you look at the scriptures, it says, in Luke 17 verse 14, it says, when he saw them, he said, go yourself, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. As they were moving away to the, to the priest, they were healed, not straight away. The fact that they weren't healed, they needed to say, I'm going to the priest to check, but they didn't see anything straight away. You see, sometimes only when we take steps in obedience without seeking results will God work. We need to act in faith before you see the results. And when you do that, that's when God will work. This was a massive miracle. This would have been a sight to see. Dead looking faces now have re-emerged ears, noses, eyebrows, lashes, hairlines, feet which were toeless, ulcerated stubs were suddenly whole, breaking through their shrunken sandals. Fingers grew back, barnacle skin became soft. What a loving gift stemming from the compassionate Christ. Amazing miracle taking place. And as they were walking, they were physically healed. But one of them was so overtaken by, by emotion, he stops in his tracks. He doesn't go to the priest. He's still a leper. Never mind religious observers, that can wait. But thanking Jesus cannot wait. His spiritual obligation to precedence over all other obligations. Not only does he want to thank Jesus, but he wanted to give himself to Jesus. In Luke chapter 17, verse, from verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. So in fact, the scripture says he was healed, and that's when he came back. So I got that wrong. He was healed, and then he came back when he saw that he was healed. You notice he's thanking God with a loud voice. Maybe it's time for us to thank God with a loud voice for our blessings. The word loud here is when we get our word megaphone. This was a really loud megaphone praise to God. Notice Jesus didn't demand this praise, but this leper offers it freely. Jesus loves for you to offer praise freely. Ten men prayed, but only one praised. Ten men prayed, but only one praised. As he as he's laying himself at Jesus' feet, he's declaring his gratitude and also giving all he has in surrender to to Christ. So the core of true thanksgiving is humility, humbly coming and kneeling at the feet of the Lord. He's not simply thinking of God's gift, but thinking of God the giver. God gives you his gifts in love, not so that you'll make idols of the gift, but truly fall in love with him, the giver. That's why he's given you the gifts. He wants you to fall in love with him and use your talents and your gifts. And I point you again to the portfolios. By putting your name there is an act of thanksgiving to God for the talents and the gifts that he's given you. And say, Lord, I'm prepared to put my name down there for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. Use me for your glory, Lord. You see, the Samaritan implied that the rest were Jews. He's the last person you would think would receive healing, especially in the eyes of the Jews. But he was the only one who truly has faith as he bows before the Lord and says, Thank you, Lord. Jesus expresses his sadness and disappointment in Luke chapter 17, verse 17, when he asks, were not all ten cleansed? Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? I don't want to make anybody feel guilty. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But when I see one or two names on the board, 
of people who want to use their talents and gifts. I want to, I can imagine the Lord saying, where are the other 40 or whatever number of my people are here at Dawn's Bay United Church? Where are they? Where are they? We don't want to serve the Lord. We don't want to use our talents. We don't want to give our gifts to the Lord. We don't want to thank Him with all our blessings. But when things go wrong or when everything comes apart, the first one we want to return to is Jesus. And that's okay. But I believe God wants us to praise Him in the good times and be used by Him in the good times, not just when everything is crumbling around us. I read these words in the commentary of this particular text, which says, I wonder if he looks out today at our churches and asks the same question. Where are the ones whom I have given my gifts to? Where are the ones who are truly thankful for what I have done for them in their lives? Where are the ones who remember how bad a condition they were in before I delivered them? Where are the nine? Why is it that when blessings come, people do not thank God, yet when problems come, they are quick to blame God? We are quick to write our blessings in sand, but engrave our complaints in marble. Close quote. It's a quote from a commentary. Some it is, he does, we, we really need to hear it. I'm sure that if you and I are caught up with those nine lepers who were healed, and you and I ask them, why? Why they did not go back to Jesus to thank him? I'm sure each of them would have given some kind of an excuse. That's what we do all the time. We make excuses. I don't have time. I'm too young. I'm too old. I can't do this. I can't do that. I wonder if this story is a parable for us today. There are a lot of people, especially in churches, wanting to use God for His blessings. Give me healing. Give me food. Give me riches. Give me a good grave for children. Give me a partner. Give me a spouse. Give me, give me, give me, give me. A lot of give me's, but no forgive me, and no very little use me. God's primary concern is that our leprous heart be cleansed. His desire is for us to fall at His feet, confess our sin, and receive Him as Lord and Savior. And if you have already done that, when is the last time you thank God for your salvation and His blessings? Could we ever sing songs worthy enough to describe His love for us? Could we preach a sermon great enough to adequately, adequately thank God? We cannot. No words in a sermon, no praise of a song can match the blessings of God to each and every one of us. We are forever indebted for God's greatest gift of salvation. We need to thank Him, sisters and brothers, every day, every day. Allow Him to use you. Wow. Can you imagine what God's going to do in our church if we allow Him to do it? You see, such a heart, a heart like that, is irresistible to God. It is irresistible to God. He loves you more than what you can imagine. He has gifted, he has gifted you. He's given you talents. He's given you health. He's given you blessings. He's given you hope. He's given you strength. Given you salvation. It's given you everything you need, even in the most difficult times of your life. He just wants to hear you say, Here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, use me. So let's turn to now in a time of fear. Let us pray. So, what are, what are we going to do now? I want to give us an opportunity, first of all. As we listen to the Word of God under the anointing of God's Spirit, I want to give you an opportunity, as we heard in the Scripture, where the man gave thanks to Jesus in a loud voice. Don't be afraid to pray out loud and say thank you to God for your blessings, whatever those blessings may be. It doesn't have to be long prayers, just in one sentence prayer. Just offer up your prayers now of thanksgiving to Jesus. Your prayers are invited.
Lord for the salvation of his daughters. Thank you, Lord, that I have found the ability to be able to serve you Yes, Lord, each day I have something to thank you for. Every day when I wake up, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that I can breathe, that I can get out of bed, that I'm still alive. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, amen. Thank you, Jesus, amen. Thank you, Jesus, amen.
thanks to God and we humbly come before Him, thanking Him for our salvation, thanking Him for the gift of life, thanking Him for our country, for our blessings, for all that we have. Let us now just have a time of intercession where we pray for those who are sick, for those who are suffering. Just lift them to the Lord now. Ask Him to heal them. for Ben as he struggles with his back. We pray for your healing power in his life. Thank you, Lord. Father, as the friends of the crippled man lowered their friend through the roof of Peter's house at your feet, it was their faith in you that moved you to heal that man. Father, we bring all the names of these people to you and lay them at your feet. And we pray that our faith would move you to heal them, to make them whole, to set them free, to comfort them, to bless them. We thank you now already for all that you have, have done, what you're going to do, and what you have already done for us. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We continue to lift our country to you. We need you to help us save this nation, Father, from corrupt politicians, evil men and women who do not put the people of this nation first. We pray that you would raise up men and women of integrity to lead this country into the future, that the economy will get stronger, that people will find work, Lord. And we pray for your church, that your church would be a voice in the dark place and a light in the dark place as Jesus shines through your church, through your people. That we can have an influence in society, a positive influence in society. And so, Father, we pray that you would heal this nation. That you would go before us, that you would bless us. When we look at the world around us, we see chaos. We see terrible suffering, terrible evil. So many people are dying, children are being slaughtered. So many families are suffering. Tears are falling, tears of grief, uncertainty. People have lost hope. Father, help us to be strong in you. We look at Europe and we look at the Americas and we see our people are losing their faith. But we thank God for the faith of the people of Africa. And we pray that you would raise up men and women in Africa as the, as the prophecies that have been spoken so many times in the past that there will be a revival from Cape Town right through Africa ending up in Egypt which will influence and impact the rest of the world. May it be so, Lord. Move your people. And may our church, yet Gordon's Bay, unite the church, and not just us, 
But brothers and sisters in this community, may we all rise up as one and be a voice of hope and peace. And so, Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We thank you, Lord, for not only hearing our prayers, but we thank you for answering our prayers. And I pray now for the anointing and the blessing on every person here today. Those who are not here as well, as they watch this video, that you would use us for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. Help us not to listen to the voice of the evil one. Help us, Lord, to be strong and determined to be used by you. What a joy to be used by you. What a privilege to be used by you. Here I am, Lord, send me. May we all cry that out to you. And so we thank you for loving us. We thank you for blessing us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.